You're watching No Spin. Tonight, we attempt to decode the ban on the Islamic outfit Popular Front of India or PFI on grounds that they are a terror outfit. A ban order passed at breakneck speed. Just one week of sweeping raids and arrests of over a thousand of its members. And then, before the ink could dry on those FIRs, a ban uploaded on the government website in the small hours of this morning. To decode the ban, we first need to understand how organizations can be banned under India's UAPA, the primary anti-terror law. The parameters for what constitutes or what can lead to a ban are fairly broad. Let's look at those pointers. It says, under UAPA, can ban any group that seeks the secession of India, disrupt the sovereignty of India, causes or is intended to cause disaffection against India, promoting enmity on grounds of religion. These are sections 153A and B of the Criminal Procedure Code. But, on the other hand, the government must specify grounds for a ban. And within 30 days, the government has to set up a tribunal on whether the ban is valid or not. The banned outfit will be served a show cause notice by this tribunal, which will hear all sides, including the banned outfit. The tribunal is to be headed by a sitting High Court judge and is to be reviewed every five years. Because of that diligence, it's not that easy to just ban organizations. If you look at the Home Ministry website to see how many outfits are currently banned, and this is since UAPA kicked in, uh, you know, in the late 60s, at the moment the list is only 14, one four, it's actually 13. With the addition of PFI, it becomes 14. So what is the basis of the UAPA ban of the PFI? Will it stand the scrutiny? The government's ban order is a slim three pages and it makes broad allegations about the PFI's terror actions and then lists a few specific charges. In addition, the government released a fairly voluminous set of unmarked documents like these to further justify the ban, like this note I'm holding in my hand. So we broke down the main specific charges cited by the government in their ban order and also the unmarked document, both what is said but also questions that are left unanswered. The order says the PFI has links to banned outfits like the JMB of Bangladesh and ISIS and that PFI activists have actually joined and fought alongside ISIS in Afghanistan, Syria and Iraq, some getting arrested and some killed in that fight. What's the proof of this? Nothing in the ban order, the unmarked document simply claims that there are 21 PFI members who joined ISIS without providing any names or details of who they are. The order says the PFI is involved in several criminal and terror cases. The proof? The unmarked document says over 1,400 criminal cases have been registered against PFI carders. These include anti-terror law charges. But there's no breakup of how many cases have led to conviction. Many of these could be simply in trial nor how many have established the PFI link. The document, this is the unmarked document, only lists one case of conviction in 2016 for an arms training camp. The ban order says the PFI carders are involved in the murder of Hindutva activists and as proof lists the names of 10 Hindutva activists who were killed between 2016 to 2022. These are very recent acts of violence. Again though, there's no breakup of how many of these cases have led to a conviction and how many have established a definitive PFI link. Now, some opposition politicians have criticized the ban, saying that while they have no sympathies for the PFI or its politics, why is the center only targeting a Muslim outfit while ignoring similar actions by extremist Hindutva groups? Asad Owesi of the AMIM tweeted saying, while I've always opposed PFI's approach and supported democratic approaches, this ban can't be supported. How come the PFI is banned, he said, but organizations associated with the convicts of the Khaja Ajmeri bomb blast aren't? Why has the government not banned right-wing majoritarian organizations? If you look at the ban order and look at the stipulations, those questions do get raised. The ban order says the PFI is pursuing an agenda to radicalize a particular section of society. But if you look at groups like the Hindu Jan Jagruti Samiti, their stated goal is Hindu Rashtra. The VHP has also stated that its holy pledge is to re-establish the Hindu Rashtra. The PFI's website actually says that they'll try to establish an egalitarian society. 
The PFI ban order says that they're accused of killing non-Muslims as the reason for the ban. Again, is the selective targeting? The RSS and other Hindutva outfits are accused of multiple killings of PFI cadre as well in Kerala and in Karnataka. Members of Hindutva outfits like Sanatan Sansta and HJS are accused in the murders of rationalists like Pansare and Dabolkar and in the Gauri Lankesh killing. The PFI ban order says that the PFI is accused of obtaining explosives. Again, is this selective targeting? Former RS Pracharaks have been convicted in the 2007 Ajmer bomb blast case. And from UP to Maharashtra and beyond, there are multiple instances of Bajrangdal workers being killed, injured while making bombs. The PFI ban order says that they are accused of raising funds in India and overseas for terror activities. But in 2017 and 2019, Bajrangdal and BJP members were arrested in Madhya Pradesh for terror funding and even spying for Pakistan's ISI. The unmarked document released by the government on PFI says that the PFI was banned amongst other reasons for holding arms training camps. But the VHP in Bajrangdal routinely holds weapons training camps. And we'll see um, some pictures of these. This is a self-defense camp that was held in Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh in 2016, where Bajrangdal activists are seen taking on other volunteers uh, wearing skull caps, playing the role, quote unquote, of terrorists. All right, let's go across to panel on this uh, big news day. We have with us Aryama Sundaram, senior lawyer, Supreme Court is here with us. Uh, Shadan Farasat, also advocate, Supreme Court. Uh, Professor Gobardhan Das, who's BJP leader, and Mohammad Tahir, lawyer for PFI. Uh, Shadan Farasat, let me start with you. On the face of it, as you look at this particular ban order, first, uh, the breathtaking speed, you know, within a week, multiple raids, arrests, and this ban. Uh, does this appear to be something which will be able to stand the kind of legal scrutiny or will there be questions about the kind of charges made and also this question of is this selective targeting? See, I have seen the uh, order of ban. Of course, there are a lot of general comment on PFI's activities. Whether or not that will withstand before a tribunal which is going to be presided by a sitting high court judge as per the act, We'll have to see because we do really don't know what material there is. But one thing is quite clear that the manner in which it has been done, that is, you know, there was, it seems a decision was taken first, which was political in nature, that yes, we have to ban it. Hmm. Then you conduct the raids. And within two days, like you are, like you pointed out, within two days of the raids, a decision comes out. So whatever may be the merits of the matter, we can't comment. Certainly, I can't comment today as a lawyer. But the manner in which it has been done, it seems that a political decision was taken first that we have to ban it. Hmm. And then things were put in place because if, you know, if raids have been done across with so many on so many entities, yeah. at least even with the highest level of efficiency, I would assume it will take some time for them to then collate all of it and then come to a conclusion as to, you know, what have they found, right. whether these activities are actually unlawful activities. So it's a political decision possibly first, and then they have taken uh, this route of ban, whether it will withstand material none of us have access to, so it's sure. difficult to... That's something to be seen. Uh, Gobardhan Das, is this going to be uh, a, a question that will be raised that, I mean, the way the ban was enforced in haste without even going through the material of all these raids, and especially this question which has been raised, as I said, by OAC and others, that you're targeting, fine, the PFI, you know, if they're guilty, go after them. But why only one side when, as we've just seen, RSS, VHP, Bajrangdal involved in very similar actions, similar charges? Yeah, uh, good evening, uh, uh, Srinivas, uh, and good evening to my fellow panelists. So yeah. I actually want to talk about the two points. Number one, the C, I mean, uh, the evidences, the before I go to evidence, I, I would like to say this is Indian a uh, citizen of this country gave the mandate to the to the government to protect the, uh, our citizens and whatever the but best. We are now, yeah, we are now on the point of a. Yeah. I mean, is there enough time to say when you say evidence? Remember, the, these are all arrests and raids that have just happened in the past week. So it's virtually yeah. impossible for anybody 
to this, jump to conclusions on the basis of that. The, um, I, uh, Two, as I said, is this selective targeting? So this afternoon I was reading it. Uh, I was reading an article in uh, the print. They they tried to collate that uh, the, all the evidences. There are several evidences they're trying to collate. This is like a the you know uh, uh, like you know 100, 120.5 crore the uh, you know uh, all all kinds of uh, funds for the anti-CA uh, protest that they ha they are links the direct but funding. Indirect. How is funding a protest a criminal offense? Yeah. And then uh, the violence, their uh, major violence, they have the link with the uh, Tablighi Jamaat, the bull smile, uh, smuggling, okay. Easter bombing. They are, they are trying to collect All the right. evidence. Um, and if I can, if I can, if I can quote, uh, if I can uh, try to find out uh, some of the points. No, no, I'm from saying we don't Easter have to go by uh, media reports because we actually have, uh, as I mentioned, we have the official ban order itself which right. we went through in detail, right. as well as some of these unmarked documents which the government released. So we, we have that. But, yeah. but just yeah. very quickly before I move on, how would yeah. you defend selective action? If you're going after groups that are inciting violence, spreading hate, creating communal division, See, and killing and killing people of other religion, why are you leaving out RSS, they, Bajrang Dal, VHP? Tell me, tell, tell me you, are, you, are, you are taking the name of RSS again and again. How many incidences of RSS people killed the other the other religion people? Can you cite an evidence? And do you have any evidence? Of what? The, you, you, you are taking the name of RSS. How many times RSS, RSS, R R RSS, is RSS is in, in North Kerala, as you are well aware, there is a killing field between the RSS, the, C, the left front and the PFI. Everyone's uh, everyone's uh, attacking uh, and RSS killing each other. How many times they killed the, uh, the other religion people? That's Did what I'm saying. Defense? There are there are there are multiple cases against RSS workers for killing PFI and left, just as there are against left and PFI for killing RSS. When 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 RSS across acro all these years, what all, are you saying? All these years, do, do you have evidence? What do you mean? Do, do I have, have evidence, evidence, sir? The yeah. these are yeah. FIRs registered. Uh, yeah. By the Kerala police, you just have to open any, I mean, you're reading out from the media, you can just open the website and you'll see it. So yeah. I'm saying, uh, you're saying it's not selective, but Mohammed Tahir, lawyer for the PFI, what is your position now? Because now the ban has been enforced. So, uh, sir, no. are you going to I now challenge, where, are, are you going to challenge the ban in the court? Are you going to no. uh, challenge before the tribunal? What are you going to do? See, so far I have not got any instruction regarding challenge because I wasn't busy in the entire court, the entire day in my court work. Okay. But certainly they are going to challenge it and tribunal as well as in high But what, high do you, what do you make of the charges though? Because they are saying the yeah, charges three, are serious. Three, 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 there are three links charges with, because, because links with ISIS, the people, uh, carrying out attacks against non-Muslims. Yes, see, because I involved in many matters and many matters for that reason I have, because I have I have already gone through the several matters. So I'll give you specific inputs about each matter. See, one you had pointed out about one terror terror trading camp in Kerala in 2016. I just wanted to clarify. Where there was a conviction. The, yeah, conviction. But conviction after that, High Court, Kerala High Court has quashed the UAPA conviction, and they categorically said in that order there is a no connection of PFI with the accused persons. That is one. The point High has Court has quashed the conviction. Can, High Court has quashed the in conviction which year? of UAPA. UAPA. In which in year? 2000, in 2016 on itself, 17 itself, in respect of UAPA. In respect of UAA, explosive of substance, conviction was okay. upheld. In respect of UAP offenses, conviction was quashed. That is one. And they categorically have said that the PFI is not involved in that. Uh, judgment okay. is very clearly Let's, said that there is no involvement of PFI. So we won't, we won't have time to go into each instance. But broadly, so, your quick take on these charges are what? That they are all baseless? Yeah. Or These are the baseless fabricated in Pepsi. The recently, as you said that, in 2022, six murders happened in Karnataka. Two murders of uh, uh, majority community Hindus and four, three murder, three, four murders of Muslim community. And all is done by the Bajradangal and PA. No, no, again, and these are allegations. Work. I'm saying... No allegations, are FIRs. No, Sir, no, but I'm saying an FIR, FIR is still, it's not, it's not a conviction. Yeah, it it's is an a, allegation but, but that but this what is... What I wanted out, what I wanted to point out is, what I point, I want pointed out is, in two cases, terror charges are invoked. Okay. Four cases, terror charges are not invoked. 
I just pointed out this thing. See, allegation against PFI is just okay, allegation. You're saying selected. Even the allegation, other FI is also allegations. All right, Arjuna Sundram. Okay, Arjuna Sundram. Uh, just to understand from the legal point of view, when when you uh, move for a ban, uh, as I said, we do not know how many of these cases cited by the government have convictions built into them. Uh, the available evidence suggests not many because most of these are very recent cases, and certainly the recent raids can't really count because they just happened a week ago. Uh, is that is it possible to make a case without? I mean, a convincing case without convictions to ban? Yeah, let me answer you. Uh, your, your whole question is on two different levels. One is the selective nature, as you put it, and the other is on the legality. I will not go into the selective nature because that's a political question. I don't want to deal with it. Just uh, absolutely. Well, I ask you that also. I'll come straight down to the legality. See, at the time of taking a decision, the state has to act. Information that they possess, materials they possess, and mm. those materials should justify the ban. Mm. Now, what those materials are will mm. be put down to judicial scrutiny and decided sure. by the tribunal. Which is why, if you notice, then it has to be done in thirty days. This is very similar to over the years we've had the Coffee Pot Act, we've had uh, uh, Internal Security Act, we've had right. various acts like this which deal with. Uh, in those cases, personal detention. In this case, with banning, but it's being treated with the same kind of uh, uh, you know gloves. That is to say, that within a very short time, right, it will be there so that you cannot just take an action hmm. and then say, "Now I will investigate and find the material over the next one year." Or so. Right. So therefore, as to whether the material is sufficient or not to have taken the decision, will be looked into by a tribunal within thirty days. And if they say that on the date you took the decision, the material was not sufficient, yeah. the decision will be quashed and reversed. So therein lies the issue as to the sufficiency of material. There is a tribunal which will be looking into it, and if that material is insufficient, it will be quashed. Now, coming to your second question, if a person is accused of an or if a, if an uh, if a organization. Is accused of large-spread acts of violence, of uh, criminality, of terror, whatever you say. Okay. In my view, I do not believe that convictions in all those is necessary to justify the act. Okay, you are saying convictions are not necessary. It is not. It could not be. Otherwise, you right. don't need an act like this. You don't need an act like this. Because right. if you say convictions and those convictions will come after twenty years. Right. Meantime, you have this act which has an immediacy. Hmm. Right. Purpose of the act is immediacy. Okay. Because if you wait for twenty years and say, "Look, in the meantime, you attack the sovereignty of okay. the country." Okay. So, the so as you said, that will be tested. Okay. That will be tested in court, but that's meantime, the time. How far? How much is the actual material? You see, it is not that a conviction was necessary. Right. But the material on which all this is being stated. Right. The tribunal should be satisfied that that material is sufficient. Right. Material. This tribunal is not seeing the uh, is not convicting or not. It's looking at the sufficiency okay. material. But and that is what has to be shown. That is what has to be Even checked. Before the tribunal. Right. But that's the that's the very quick point I wanted to ask you, uh, Gobardhan Das, because in the in the Ajmer blast case, you were talking about RSS. RSS was actually convicted. Three three pracharaks of the RSS. Were convicted. I mean, after they were convicted, the RSS said they're no longer with us. But they were convicted in the Ajmer blast case. Govardhan Das. Yeah, yeah. You tell me. I'm, I'm little. Yeah, I'm not feeling well. That's okay. So uh, Three, yeah. I'm saying pracharaks of the RSS were convicted in the in the Ajmer blast case. In Ajmer case, that the you know I uh, I I don't remember now. Somehow I'm not feeling well. But, but the thing is, see, this is what are the best things to, do to protect the country. The government is doing the is best what uh, what needs okay. to be done. In this case, basically, the, there are several evidences that they put the gov government right. put and they put the ban. So that's that's all okay. about. I can say right at this moment. You're saying that the government is trying to protect the country. All right, uh, I have to. Uh, you know, this has been a, a great panel, but I also have to move on to an uh, interview I did earlier with G.K. Pillai, 
uh, former Home Secretary because he was Home Secretary at a time when there was the question of the ban uh, on the PFI coming up. And I began by asking him that when you were Home Secretary and when the ban to, uh, or the proposal to ban PFI came up, uh, what exactly happened then? Yes, it did come up. Uh, the issue of uh, banning PFI did come up uh, during when I was Home Secretary. Uh, we did a com comprehensive uh, uh, analysis of uh, PFI's functioning, uh, their constitution, what uh, the, the messages they send, what is their content, and all the activities that they did. A very comprehensive survey was done by all agencies. Uh, there was, of course, a certain, certain amount of pressure for uh, banning the PFI. But looking at all the evidence that finally came on board and uh, in consultation with the law ministry of that time, uh, we felt that uh, the activities of the PFI at that stage uh, were what we would call as legitimate within the normal bounds of a democratic state and that uh, any uh, order by the government to ban uh, PFI at that stage hmm. uh, would not stand uh, the test of law. Right, but what were you, what was the grounds for considering the uh, ban in the first place and why did those grounds fall short according to you, according to the view then? I think it, fall, it fell short because we could not find uh, at that stage any concrete evidence that the PFI was, uh, had called for violent violence had called for any armed uh, uh, struggle or armed uh, hack actions against the government or uh, any organization. Uh, it was by and large uh, taking up issues which were in the public domain, uh, con primarily concerning minorities, uh, Dalits and others. And uh, they were making what we would call as uh, democratic protests uh, within the constitution of India. And therefore, uh, we felt that uh, even though uh, at many cases you could say they were like borderline cases, but uh, they, um, you always give the presumption of doubt uh, in, in the absence of any specific evidence that they had given calls for violence or uh, the armed overthrow of the Indian government and so on. Right. But, why, but my question sir, was why were you even considering the ban in the first place? Uh, no, there was a lot of agitations which uh, the PFI were doing at that time. Uh, you know, protests uh, and so on. And uh, uh, across many states on many issues. But, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in effect, what, you know, a protest itself is not a, a form for a, a reason uh, for banning them. Uh, you have to have concrete evidence that uh, they are in trying to indulge in violence, they are indulging any activities which will threaten the uh, sovereignty or integrity of India, uh, and so on. And uh, it was our considered view at that time, and I must say it is at uh, that time because 11 years have passed by. Uh, at that time, uh, we felt that uh, the evidence which was on record, and it's on it's on file in the Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, did not uh, warrant uh, the banning of the organization. And this was a view which was then upheld by the then uh, Law Minister, Minister of Law, and right. also the union home minister. But what about, but what about the, the, this business of violent attacks or of holding training camps and all of that? Did that not in itself constitute grounds for a ban as it is now? I don't think so. I think in having training camps or carrying out uh, drills and so on, uh, a number of, number of organizations in India do it. And uh, it has to be linked to uh, finally what you see in terms of the objectives of the organization and what the directions they give to the rank and file, what they need to do. So long as the uh, the directions and everything are within what we call as within law and within uh, normal uh, rights of democratic protest, uh, uh, this is allowed in a democracy. And that is what our, as I said, it is a 2010-2011 decision that uh, at, at that time, mm. Uh, there was okay. uh, not enough, not evidence, enough evidence to justify a ban. Right. And and who, uh, okay. So, and who, sir, was the Home Minister at that time? The Home Minister was Mr. P. Chidambaram. He's, he's himself a distinguished lawyer. Hmm. And uh, the Law Ministry also, to whom 
we submitted all the papers and all the evidence that had been put up by all the agencies and the analysis. Uh, also concurred with us that uh, at that on the basis of the evidence at that time, yeah, uh, uh, you there was no justification for a ban. Okay, but you know this is going to come up because this was under the UPA. Was there any political pressure to not ban? No, I think there was a lot of pressure from the agencies to ban, uh, and that is how the whole thing came up. And then uh, we uh, asked the agencies to uh, submit all the evidence that they had and. Uh, in the, in the light of the provisions in the UAP Act, uh, would that justify uh, invoking for the ban? Right. And last, last question to you is, uh, you know, because we're trying to go by what the NIA and the Home Ministry have put out in the light of today's ban, that how much does the evidence have to be rigorous in terms of, like, you can't just make general allegations. Uh, how specific do you need to be in regard to the evidence? We have to bring uh, substantial rigor uh, into this, uh, what the allegations that you make or the evidence that you provide. Uh, finally, uh, if, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, what it's, it, all this evidence goes before a sitting High Court judge who is actually nominated by the Chief Justice of the Concerned High Court. And you have to present this evidence to him. I think if I'm not mistaken, I'm not, uh, I think it's within six months right. uh, of the ban, you have to produce this evidence and he has to uphold the ban. Okay. We'll have to uphold the ban. Well, we'll have to wait and see how it plays out in stage two when all of this goes before the courts. But uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining me, Mr. Pillay. And uh, thank you so much for watching. That's all the time we have on No Spin tonight.